Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome back to another episode of the Free Marketeers podcast. This week, week we have a very special guest, Mark Oppenheimer, with us. He's joining myself and Martin von Staden. Mark, thank you very much for being with us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys. Um, today, on the 16th of April, um, earlier today, Minister in Corsuzana at Lamini Zuma announced the revision change, I suppose, if you want to call it that, of regulations uh, in terms of the lockdown for South Africa. Uh, just a few things I wanted to highlight. So I just read an article about it. Some of the changes include the transportation of essential goods and service. Essential goods are permitted from warehousing sites to essential service providers. Uh, plumbers and electricians will be allowed to visit homes to fix broken utilities. Restrictions on exports have been eased so that the country's ports are not congested when the lockdown is lifted. The only alcohol which may be transported is for commercial purposes, such as hand sanitizers. And all the mines that supply ESCOM must be fully operational and refineries should work at full capacity. Now, we know that ESCOM, of course, is never operating at full capacity, so I suppose we shouldn't worry too much that it'll be over, um, over, overburdened with this. Just in terms of these changes, do you guys see anything substantial in them? Do you think this is the right sort of move going forward? I know that's a bit of a broad question, but I just wanted to get your take on this development. All South Africans, I think, are hopeful that the lockdown will end at the end of April. Do you think this is a move in that direction? I think, Mark, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah. So I suppose being hopeful about things doesn't mean that those things will happen. Um, you know, ultimately what you want is for government to be making its decisions, um, you know, guided on evidence and there are going to be, uh, two interrelated factors that play that role. So the first is obviously the health consequences. So, you know, the purpose of the lockdown really is to prevent the hospitals from being overwhelmed. Um, so that if you can sort of, filter your population through um, the hospitals given the amount of resources um, you can then prevent a lot of people from dying. Um, now the second factor of course is the health of the economy. Now they're not a simple trade-off because if your economy fails it will have health consequences. So you will find that if your economy fails you'll have mass rioting, you'll have social disorder you know and all those things will lead to a loss of life. So the two must work hand in hand. And the trick is to try and find the correct balance um, and to work out which measures are going to be effective. Now, um, I gather that one of the views on a lockdown period is that for it to be um, more effective, um, so that you sort of try and save lives, the lockdown period needs to be about 49 days. Um, that implies a further extension. I think one of the reasons why we're seeing piecemeal extensions is um, partly so that government can survey the landscape and give itself options, but partly I think if if you do something very dramatic, like announce a three month lockdown, um, you might have no buy in at all. Um, mm -hmm. Where you tell people three weeks, they might say I can tolerate three weeks, and then once you're in week two, you can then extend and extend. Um, so, I mean, so Botswana, for example, have declared um, a, a national emergency of six months. Um, sure. To give you an idea, they have only 13 cases in one day, but their resources are incredibly limited. So they know that they cannot um, afford to have an outbreak because they just don't have the hospital beds um, and that it could be cataclysmic for them. As I pointed out, in other words, if you have a mass loss of life, that will have economic consequences. Um, you know, when we think about those that are most vulnerable, they're often elderly, but, um, you know, a lot of older people are titans of industry, are judges, um, are the heads of NGOs. Um, so if a lot of those people died, it would have terrible economic consequences and social consequences. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Martin, for you, um, anything in particular you'd like to highlight in these recent uh, changes? Well, I'm just quite uh, encouraged by the, the concession, at least, uh, if you can call it that, that the lockdown will be phased out. So um, I think that the uh, minister said that these regulations are providing uh, a of the um, lockdown. I think that is encouraging. Um, I think that the economic lockdown in general far outweigh, I think, the benefits that we're getting from it. Um, I think that if we have a collapsed economy, then it's probably going to be far worse in the long term for everyone. Um, so I think that whatever is decided, the lockdown needs to be become less strict very quickly. 
Um, so I'm not saying that the whole thing needs to needs to end. I've I think from the start I thought it would be a good idea to, for instance, lock down old people specifically, um, uh, lock down as many TB and HIV positive people as you can. I know you can never have a airtight uh, thing, but just try lesser intervention. Uh, people will die. We, we simply cannot avoid that. But we need to keep the economy going. Um, I guess the only uh, solace I get from that is that the global economy is, is doing badly in general. So it's not like the South African government is alone in totally mishandling and misstepping here. It's, it's, some, it's, some, it's, it's uncharted territory. So I, I think in this case, at least, I'm not I don't have, uh, 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 what do you call it, spit coming out of my mouth with hatred for government in this respect. I think they're, uh, they're fumbling along as best they can as other governments are. But uh, I, I mean, as, as a free marketeer, I think the market needs to be freed, even under these circumstances, uh, maybe even especially under these circumstances. So yeah, that, that small thing, that concession that there will at least be a scaling down of the lockdown after the 30th of April, that gives me some encouragement. But, sorry, as far as the uh, actual substance of the new regulations go, I couldn't see anything that's um, really radical. Uh, nothing, nothing changes the, the nature of the already existing regulations. Um, so all the silly regulations still remain and are as bad as they were. Um, I think that the, the opening of the ports is probably a, a great step, um, but otherwise, is uh, nothing big has changed. Okay, thanks, thanks, Martin. Um, I think it's important just to highlight when these sort of changes come about. Whether you know, we we just want to point out to people that maybe we shouldn't run too far with hope. We also shouldn't be too cynical on the other side. But just there seems to be some movement, and let's let's see what keeps developing in the next few weeks. Um, now to the the main purpose of our discussion: uh, a few meta, I suppose, or bigger picture legal considerations and questions that I wanted to to get your guys' view on. So we'll start first of all with, um, with the Constitution. Mark, what does the Constitution say about lockdowns and disasters? Um, maybe you can obviously apply specifically this latest lockdown, but just if you want to talk in general about what the South African Constitution says about, about this sort of thing. Sure. Um, so I've written a, a report which is being updated on a regular basis for AfriForum called Know Your Rights, um, which basically sort of gives a list um, of your constitutional rights and what the framework is for limiting those rights. So the constitution has um, uh, two sections which sort of deal with, with um, rights limitations quite explicitly. The first is um, section 36, the limitations clause, which is the clause that is operating at the moment. So the idea is that you can uh, limit a right in the Bill of Rights um, when it is reasonable to do so in an open and, in an, in an open and democratic country. There's sort of like a rationality test. The other one is when you declare a state of emergency. Now we have not declared a state of emergency, which means the effect to suspend a lot of the rights in the Bill of Rights. Not all can be suspended. So for example, the right to life is not derogable. So the state couldn't suddenly impose a death penalty to, to punish people, yeah, even if it had a state of emergency. Um, but the purpose of a state of emergency really is to restore peace and order. Um, so there would be no reason to, de to declare a state of emergency because we are not in a state of um, war uh, or in a state of disorder. Um, we may find though that a continual lockdown could lead to massive social unrest, which then could trigger a state of emergency. But at the moment, we have our rights in the Bill of Rights and they are being limited um, in various ways by the regulations. So the most obvious one is we have a right to freedom of movement in the constitution, which has been heavily limited. Um, you know, you can only leave your house for a very circumscribed set of things. Um, and so the question, of course, then becomes, well, is it reasonable? Um, and the argument is, well, it is a life-saving measure. Um, if we allowed people, to, if we had a completely laissez-faire approach, um, in other words, we had no interventions whatsoever, um, you would have um, the disease growing at um, a very rapid rate. Um, and I'm sure most people are familiar with those early epidemiological models, um, which showed this sort of um, cataclysmic growth. Um, and if you look at South Africa, um, assuming for the sake of argument that um, the results we're getting in are accurate, we are starting to flatten the curve. In other words, we're not having as, as much a steep rise of growth as we uh, could have had. Um, so 
what, but I think it's important that we remain vigilant during this time. You know, as someone who cares about freedom, you, know, you, you want to be able to at least observe what is happening in terms of your rights being limited. Now, some of the rights limitations are going to go beyond mere limitations and are going to be violations. In other words, they are not justifiable um, and there'll be room to challenge them. Uh, we know there have been a couple of court challenges at the moment around um, freedom of movement. So um, on the first day of the lockdown, someone wanted to travel across a province to go to a funeral um, and applied to court and the court said no. Um, we know that um, legal practitioners have very limited room for movement. They have to can only appear in urgent matters. Um, and even then, the idea is that it should be done either on paper or video conference. Um, but um, in, a, in a case, some practitioners traveled to another province to deal with the matter and they were censured quite heavily by the judge for not proving that they had the correct permits. So the sense that I get from the judiciary is that um, you know, the number of cases is being heavily, heavily limited, um, basically for urgent matters related to COVID, um, which would include challenging the laws, um, and then also dealing with um, bail applications. So people who are arrested, for example, um, will need to seek bail. And your, your constitutional rights give you the ability to be brought before um, um, you know, a judicial officer within 48 hours of an arrest. Um, we've had a couple of arrests with things. So for example, there was a, a wedding where um, 50 wedding guests, the, uh, the priest and the wedding couple were arrested. Um, there is someone who's been arrested for um, the claim is that they intentionally deceived people about uh, COVID or government efforts to um, um, address COVID. Um, and that the penalty for that is a period of up to six months imprisonment. So arrests are taking place. There's an interesting free speech dilemma. Um, you know, it's under any ordinary circumstance, you know, people are allowed to disseminate false information um, because we trust that in a marketplace of ideas, you know, um, falsehood will lose out to truth that given enough time and interrogation, people will find out what is actually true. You know, it might be that false ideas ramp up quickly, um, but they don't last very long under the sort of scrutiny of light. The question is whether under pandemic conditions and panic conditions, it's okay to um, stop false speech because it might have these cataclysmic effects. In that particular instance, the person was calling on people not to be um, tested for COVID on the basis that there might be uh, contaminated tests. Um, so th obviously the concern is that if you interfere with the testing process, you know, um, it's going to give us not very good information for how to address the problem. Um, and it's quite important that people are compliant with regard to the testing. But, you know, raising a concern that the, the tests are not contaminated, one might think is a fair concern. He didn't say they are, he said they might be. Uh, Martin, I just want to, I'll throw it to you on this one, an aspect I wanted to highlight, and especially in light of your recent report that you've done, viewers, that is available on our website if you'd like to read it in, in more depth, and I would encourage you to do so. So the question of whether it's legally relevant that South Africa is one of the most heavy-handed interventions around the world, um, and if you can compare that to sort of other countries. So in light of what Mark has said, you know, maybe you can make the case for something, I don't know, free speech, for example, uh, if someone is saying certain things about tests and that sort of thing. I mean, surely you could question that, but then, you know, to what extent, again, the whole issue of fake news, that sort of thing. I mean, you would really consider all, the, for, uh, for us at least from a, a libertarian perspective, you would think that these sorts of things should always be um, absolute, but, but just your thoughts on that. Yeah, so the... From my limited research on what other countries have done, I mean, I've, I've gotten the New York Times versions of what they've done, but I haven't seen anything that uh, uh, other, at least Western liberal democracies have done that come close to this prohibition on, on uh, fake news. I mean, uh, Facebook and Twitter are very uh, active as private organizations organizations and combating, for instance, the spreading of fake news. Uh, Google as well, I believe Google's algorithms have actually, uh, um, uh, what's the word, uh, moved down COVID results. So uh, if you just put out a blog post, you're not going to get your usual search engine um, uh, optimized results for that. So the market has definitely responded to the, uh, the fake news issue, especially as it relates to COVID. But I'm not aware that any other countries are doing what South Africa is doing, or at least what Becky Taylor is doing, by uh, literally he's been offended by someone 
and he has them arrested for crimen in Uriel because they challenged him uh, in a video saying they won't abide by the regulations as they're drinking and stuff. Uh, I think South Africa is, is leading the pack, unfortunately, in, in that regard. Um, and as to the relevance of what other countries are doing, I'm not sure that legally it is relevant. So our constitutional court has, in applying the limitations test, the uh, uh, limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society. They've done something quite bizarre, in my view at least, and that is they've looked at what they consider to be open and democratic societies around the world and seen if they do that. And if they do that, then we can do that. Uh, the most uh, um, uh, relevant case, I think, in that regard is state versus Jordan or Jordan, uh, in which the, uh, uh, the banning, the prohibition on prostitution was upheld in South Africa, even though when you read the ordinary text of the constitution, I would argue it is absolutely legal uh, to be a prostitute in South Africa, uh, no, no hesitation. But our constitutional court said, yeah, but you see, uh, even Holland prohibits prostitution, except under certain circumstances, the United, United States prohibits it, the United Kingdom prohibits it. Therefore, it's reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society. I found that to be very weak reasoning. Um, but I think our courts will look at what other countries are doing. I don't think they should be. Uh, I think that we should develop, a, I guess, called an indigenous uh, South African constitutional jurisprudence around what the text of our constitution actually means within the context of what a constitution is. And that fundamentally always comes back to limiting the power and scope of government, the interest of securing for the individual the maximum potential liberty. Um, so that's, that, that's what I think uh, needs to be said about the relevance of what other countries are doing. But like I said, on the freedom of speech thing, um, I may be wrong. I, I, I don't know if other countries are doing something similar. I just haven't seen it. I know uh, some countries are more strict than us in other respects, but on freedom of speech, I think it's totally unjustifiable what our government is doing. I think uh, um, South Africans should be considered adults by the government and if someone were to spread fake news the government uh, not that it's its place to trust or not trust us but it should trust us to make that decision for ourselves now of course in response to this video that mark talked about that encouraged people not to get tested the point is the regulations make it illegal to refuse to be tested so even if you agree with it you can't refuse uh, so i don't really see the point of of punishing this person uh, who was raising what I guess is a fair point. I didn't watch the video, but apparently he was citing um, information from mainstream media in the United Kingdom where there were reports that uh, tests have been contaminated. Uh, I don't know if he added his own little tail onto that. But the point is like Mark alluded to, so indeed contaminated, someone should be saying so. Uh, and, and even if that weren't the case, I think I trust people to make up their own mind. I think the fake news panic uh, has been somewhat of a, a, a scourge in, in, in liberal democracies over the last, how long is it since Donald Trump has been elected? Four years. Uh, that's when it started. Suddenly fake news is, is now an issue that governments to respond to. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, just just let it let it lie, trust people to make up their own minds. Um, I mean, uh, we, we can't, we couldn't trust government in, in ideal circumstances. I don't think we'd be trusting government in the most pressing and uh, uh, chaotic circumstances either, uh, because you don't function better when you're under stress. So I think the praise government has been getting is deeply worrying, even if some of what they're doing is justified, the default position should just be to think government is, is trying to undermine us. Mark, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to highlight something there that Martin talked about, the, you know, what a constitution sort of is or should be. Um, and here, I think it's important to always highlight the, the rule of law, the concept of the rule of law and the, the spirit in which laws are formulated, you know, what they, how they should be formulated, the goal towards, the, to what, towards what they should aim. Um, just in terms of these regulations, you know, we I think a lot of them are arbitrary and they make it difficult for people to operate. So a lot of people might understand why they're necessary and they might support the lockdown. 
but also they simply don't know what they can and can't do and how they're supposed to live their lives in any sort of minimal way. Um, so I just, uh, I thought if you could talk a little bit about that, the importance of, of that aspect. Yes, yeah, sure. So, um, let's, let's look at a, let's look at an interesting case for something that looks irrational. So if you are Woolworths, you're allowed to operate during this time. Okay. And you can sell essential goods, but if you stock non-essential goods in your store, you can't sell them. Okay. Um, so for example, um, there were, I saw photos early on in the lockdown of pharmacies having tape over their condom section mm-hmm. okay, on the grounds that condoms are not. Okay. Now, uh, if you're, a, let's say pick and pay, you've got lots of, um, you know, various items that you stock that are essential goods and you, and refused. Okay. It seems bizarre that you say, I'm going to the store, you've got this item that I would like to buy. Um, so what's the problem? Just sell it. Okay. Now I suppose the argument is that if you were a savvy businessman who was in the business of, let's say selling household appliances, which you can't sell now because they're not essential. Um, but if you sold some essential goods, your whole store could operate. Well, then you would start selling things like bread or milk or whatever it is to keep your store open. And so would everyone else who sells non-essential goods, um, which would then, let's say, compromise the purpose of a lockdown, which is to stop people from gathering in public spaces. So there is some in- intended um, effect that will happen from, from the nature of these lockdowns. Um, now, if we think about the, the problem with this distinction between essential and non-essential, is that we can we can sort of identify quite easily what the essential goods are, what everyone needs, uh, and we can identify essential services to some extent. But those essential services require um, other services so that they can operate. You know, there's basically a sort of pyramid, um, and you know, so for example, if you say, well, laptops are not essential, okay, but you accept that um, you know people who are who are going to be working essential services might need access to computers if they fail. You know, there's a problem there. So there's, you know, economies are very interconnected and it's not so simple that you can just shut down parts of the economy. You might be able to do it in the short term, but in the long term, you definitely can't and you're going to eventually grind to a halt. Um, so this notion of trying to work out, well, what, how do you keep your economy alive? How do you keep the interconnectedness alive? Um, while trying to kind of avoid some of the health ramifications is not a simple one. You know, you're dealing with a complex system. So to try and determine how that will be, will be, will be difficult. Look on your rule of law question. What you want is your laws to be accessible so that people can understand what is required of them. Um, and I, I suppose in some ways the regulations, um, do that. Um, I've, I've tried to make it more accessible with my report and it, it doesn't deal with every aspect of the regulations. It deals with, um, fundamental rights. So you can sort of see which rights are being limited, but you know, if you want to find out whether you're an essential service or not, you know, there's going to be some degree of ambiguity, but you can sift through the regulations and see whether you're covered or not. The other thing we've got to think about is, um, you know, more long term, um, you know, how does our society operate? Um, are we going to be moving more towards these sort of digital meetings, um, you know, online retail, um, you know, delivery stores, you know, those sorts of things are going to seem to make a difference for kind of at least being able to keep our, our economy on some form of life support. Um, and uh, I know that the head of take a lot has sort of said that they think that they should be entitled to sell whatever they stock. Um, because if you don't have the worry about someone congregating in the store, you know, the delivery guy is going to deliver it. If you're concerned that there's only so many delivery people, um, well, you know, that's a wonderful thing because then it means it's, you know, people who have a driver's license can suddenly become delivery people and participate in the economy. Um, you know, we saw early on that, um, Uber eats was unable to operate because they, you know, they supply from restaurants and restaurants can They've now moved um, so that they can they offer essential goods. Um, so all those goods who are temporarily out of work are now back in the economy. Um, and I think we have to accept that markets are going to play a very important role in addressing the health concerns. They are producing all of the goods that we need um, and are going to be very innovative and quick to pivot in a way that government isn't. You know, there's a limit to central planning. Um, central planning looks like a great idea in a time of crisis. You know, and the problem is the central planners want to stick around when the crisis is over because they'll say, for example, Baker Taylor has said, mm-hmm. you know, look how wonderful it is when people don't drink. You know, there's less assaults and there's less road deaths. We should do this afterwards. Um, so, you know, they, they like having that kind of power. Uh, they don't think of the consequences of the consequences. We know, for example, in America, when you had um, 
alcohol prohibition, you're allowed um, the mafia to sort of to grow, you know, um, that people will find a way and you end up supporting all sorts of things that you don't want to support, you know, like a big crime network. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we often find that central planners are good at thinking about the immediate consequences, but not necessarily the consequences beyond that. Martin, to touch on what Mark said there with unintended consequences and you know, people people should be vigilant in terms of going forward. Maybe some bureaucrats and politicians will want to keep uh, some of these regulations in place. What are there any specific methods or ways that people can keep an eye on this sort of thing very specifically? Do they work through organisations such as Afri Forum, for example? Other ones that that you could think of? Can they do a lot in their own capacity? What sort of advice do you have in that regard? Well, I, I don't want to be too philosophical, but I think the... the oh, always be more philosophical than not, please. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the place you always need to start is inside yourself. And that's something I think South Africans have not yet learned. And this crisis has blown my mind even more than I thought it could be blown in how immediately, I would say probably most politically conscious South Africans including many people I firmly considered mm -hmm. to be very government skeptic, uh, people who would only have bad things to say about government. But the moment Ramaphosa made his first speech, they were head over heels in love. Mm. Uh, and they were like, we are led, hashtag, we are led, Ramaphosa is showing the way. That type of mentality is extremely dangerous. Like, I, I hate seeming dramatic about it, but it is extremely, extremely dangerous. Uh, and not just for this crisis. It is a mentality that should never exist. You must always be skeptical of what government does. You should never, under any circumstances whatsoever, trust the government. You must always prefer your own uh, abilities, uh, your own freedom, your own choice to make the right choices for yourself. And then, I guess, in a hierarchy, prefer your family, your community, uh, your friends, your uh, your internet service provider. And then way at the very end of that uh, uh, level of trust, you, you can come to the conclusion that, okay, fair enough. Uh, now maybe I should look at what government is saying. Uh, so that is always the first step to uh, freedom. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, they describe it to Benjamin Franklin, but Wendell Phillips or someone else probably said it, that the um, price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Uh, in all circumstances, and especially in crisis circumstances. You need to be aware of what government is up to. You should be reading what government is saying and trusting absolutely none of it. Um, and then, of course, you need to be involved with organizations like the Free Market Foundation, the Institute of Race Relations. Afri Forum also has a very keen eye on uh, violation of civil rights. Uh, and then are there are others, the Helen Sussman Foundation, um, OTA, uh, the Freedom of Expression Institute, they're quite inactive, but uh, when they are active, they do very good work. Um, these organizations exist, and more often than not, they depend entirely on, um, on donations from the public, and uh, they provide the information, uh, they, or they distill the information, at least, that you need to know to know what government is up to. And yeah, I would encourage everyone to at, pick at least one of these organizations, start supporting them. Um, uh, I would obviously uh, have a bit of a bias in favor of supporting the Free Market Foundation uh, from a very strong libertarian perspective. We uh, keep a very watchful eye on whatever government does. And if you're looking for uh, or, uh, an organization that is not uh, fawning over how we are being hashtag led in this crisis, you can look no further than the FMF. Uh, it, is, it is totally absurd how South Africans are just falling in line with this. And I would encourage our viewers, please, take note of those neighbors who are reporting people taking their dogs for a walk. Just keep a little notebook and make sure you remember who they are because they are not the people that are going to help you in times of crisis. They are not the people who you can go to when you're in need. These are the useful idiots who create um, tyranny 
at the end of the day, the slowly boiling frog uh, story, as we all are all familiar with. These are the people who enable that. And these are fundamentally the people who, if South Africa is to collapse, who will be the cause of that collapse. So keep note of that and then don't lend bread or sugar to your neighbors if you know them to be like that. Um, but yeah, that's, those are my thoughts on, on how to be vigilant. Um, just distrust and uh, mistrust anything and everything that government says, even if it's your preferred political party that's in charge or whoever uh, the mayor you may like, who um, says most of the time what you, what you like. Uh, ju just mistrust all of that. Trust yourself and your own ability to, to distill information. Um, and don't, don't never, ever, ever uh, externalize or delegate your personal responsibility to, to some minister or some bureaucrat. Uh, that's, that's the slippery slope to, to massive disappointment and misery. I think you're very right there, Martin, to point out the eternal vigilance responsibility on the shoulders of every civilian, at least if they don't want to just pay lip service to freedom. If we want to continue having freedom in a real sense in South Africa, we must be especially vigilant in times like these. Uh, Mark, I'll give you the final word. Any parting thoughts, anything going forward? Uh, I don't know, maybe if you think that lockdown will be extended, I know we don't want to commit to anything like that necessarily, or if you have any other prophetic words for the viewers. Yeah, so I will leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, this crisis will end um, in terms of the health question. We will then have to rebuild our society. And I think it's going to be so important that we start thinking about um, this crisis as an opportunity in two ways. The one is it's going to be an opportunity um, for classical liberalism to provide some good solutions for how to deal with the mess that we're going to be in. It's also going to be a crisis in the sense that bad actors are going to try and use this as a way of um, their benefit. So think about something, compensation. Now, um, I, I've been writing a lot on that. I've done a submission to Parliament um, and have, have said that this is you know, one of those things that could be absolutely catastrophic for our economy. Now, what's changed afterwards? It'll be much, much worse. We're going to have a much more fragile economy. We cannot, um, in Dan providing our food, um, all of those that are running manufacturing businesses because, you know, the proposed constitutional amendment would allow people to have their, their land and improvement seats, which would include um, businesses. So we really need to sort of have a, you know, hands off private property rights um, campaign afterwards um, and, and start pushing those ideas now because there will be um, calls to say, well, the state needs to nationalize everything. Mm -hmm. um, the state should be taking all hospitals because you know, that way we can sort of uh, ensure that everyone gets fair and equitable access to hospital beds. So there will be those calls. We know Julius Mnema made that sort of um, statement early on. Um, so, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, now is a time to start thinking about um, solutions that have been boiling around for a while, like fiscal responsibility. You know, I, I think now we're sort of seeing that SAA uh, will not be getting further, further bailouts and, and may end up being liquidated. Um, but there are going to be many well, yeah. other um, government. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, there are going to be many other government projects that, that really should be shelved um, because they are so expensive and that we're going to need money to be put towards um, you know, economic survival um, and the survival of people's health and quality of life. Um, so I really think what should be done is people should be looking at um, Tito's prior budget and going through with a red pen to say, you know, uh, these things cannot be here, we cannot afford them. Um, and so those sorts of solutions, I think, are the sort of things we need to be looking at, you know, beyond just the immediacy of our situation. Oh, the buzzword, the concept of structural reform is floating around a lot now, but we need the right kind of structural reform. I think, as you've said, we, we shouldn't aim towards structural reform that's simply going to increase state control. We need pro-individual freedom, um, pro-free markets structural reform. Martin, any last thoughts from you? Yeah, no, I think that um, Mark is totally right. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, in as much as it is a crisis. Um, I think classical liberals are, we tend to be more on the critical side and we often don't provide solutions. I think we need to shelve that for the moment and come up with uh, very innovative and uh, common sense solutions to what comes after. 
Um, and I think obviously at the very forefront of that will need to be deregulation. If ever it is now that the economy is going to need room to breathe, um, we need labor laws, for instance, to if not totally scrapped, but to be significantly uh, uh, um, toned down for at least a few years to make sure that all of these additional unemployed, I mean, we went into this with about 10 million unemployed South Africans, and I think that number is just going to skyrocket uh, during the course of this crisis. We need these people to to get back to work and we need many of them to find work for the first time in their lives and the labor laws are the one basically the only barrier standing between uh, most of those people and employment so this inclination that uh, we need more socialism during and after a time of crisis which many people have pointed to that there's, there's a very real risk that hard left uh, organizations and even hard right wing uh, socialist organizations might uh, uh, seem very popular during and after this crisis and they may, might be propelled to victory. We need to reject that with all the power uh, and influence that we have because that is just going to make it worse. We need to insist that uh, because it is the truth fundamentally that freedom is going to allow the economy to be rebuilt. Um, and freedom uh, was not what caused the coronavirus. Uh, there, were, there wasn't this open borders world where through the coronavirus suddenly spread and now we're all in trouble because of freedom and globalization and free trade. No, no, we had a strict, uh, all around the world, strict immigration systems and yet it still spread and i think the message that people should get from that is no matter how hard you try unless you close the borders totally these types of things will get in so don't even go there uh, prefer freedom uh, always err on the side of more liberty uh, and that will tend to produce uh, the best results for everyone and that includes especially the most vulnerable people in our society so on that note of Martin outing himself as a utilitarian, I think we'll, we'll end. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for your time, for joining us. Martin, always a pleasure. Uh, viewers, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, please remember to follow our work, www.freemarketfoundation.com. Please like this video. Please share it uh, amongst uh, all your friends on your different social media platforms. Please look out for more of these episodes in the next few weeks, uh, at least until the lockdown is over, we'll continue to put out as much content as possible, trying to keep you as informed as we possibly can. Uh, we'll chat to you again soon. Have a good week ahead and bye for now. Cheers.